previous meeting, review correspondence, and then there are three items on the consent agenda, uh, comfy cape, daycare, site plan amendment, community center, office building, change of use, and the Golden Ridge subdivision approval extension. Pond Cove Edition Cape High School renovation site plan, uh, public hearing. Uh, Nedwell access way permit also is scheduled for a public hearing this evening. And then it's under new business is the Cape Elizabeth Commons site plan and that will be reviewed for site plan completeness. So uh, first issue is review of the minutes of the previous meeting. If everyone's had a chance to review the minutes, are there any changes, additions? Barbara, did you find anything? No. No? Okay. Anybody else? Do we have a motion? Mr. Chairman, I have a motion that we accept the minutes as presented. Moved and seconded. All in favor? <coughs> all right. The minutes are approved. Uh, under correspondence, the we need to identify. We have a memorandum from Public Works Director, re the Nedwell Private Access Way Permit, a memorandum from the Cape Elizabeth School Board regarding the school project, and a memorandum from the town manager regarding Cape Elizabeth Commons. Uh, we also were provided this evening with a letter from Michael C. Baldler, and that's in regards to the comfy daycare uh, site plan amendment. Anything else? Probably? Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't unclip. Okay. Also, was a letter from Dana Morton uh, submitted on behalf of Henry and James Steinberg, and this is again regarding the Nedwell Private Access Way. Um, a letter from Tom Greer, the engineer, Pinkman Greer, and this is regarding the school project, letter of March 11th, 2004, and also from Pinkman Greer, a catalog cut for lighting again in connection with the school project. We get it all? Okay. All right. The first issue which is on originally scheduled for the consent agenda uh, is the Comfy Cape Daycare Site Plan Amendment. Um, I'd like to again remind the board that if anyone on the board feels that an item should be moved from the consent agenda to the regular agenda, we have to do that by motion. But should there be any uh, type of inquiry or uh, dispute regarding the issue, uh, that is appropriate to be moved to the regular agenda. Does anyone? Yes. Or Since we've had a letter from uh, the Bowsler's who own the abutting property stating that there is um, an encroachment onto their property, I move that we move it to the regular agenda. All right. So moved. Do we have a second? Second. Moved and seconded. Uh, all in favor of the motion to move the Comfy Cape Daycare Site Plan Amendment from the consent agenda to the regular agenda Please raise your hand. Okay, that's unanimous. So that will be moved to the regular agenda. Um, what I would like to do, if the applicant, is the applicant here? Okay. Um, I'd like to go through the other two consent agenda items and then you can uh, address it, the application. I, I recently learned that the plot plan that 
question is incorrect, and I was going to ask if I could just table this until next month so that the Okay, that that sounds like uh, that would be a good idea. Uh, we, I'll make a motion to table. Do we have a second? Okay, moved and seconded. All in favor? Okay, so that will be tabled until next month. Sure. The next consent agenda item is the community center office building change of use. Uh, the town is requesting an amendment to the previously approved site plan for the community center at 343 Ocean House Road to change the use of the second floor of the front building from an apartment to office space. <coughs> this is pursuant to section 19-9-6 site plan amendments. Again, uh, is there any Anyone on the board that wishes to move this to the regular agenda? Okay, hearing uh, no intention for that, do we have a motion on the town's request? Mr. Chairman? Yes. I have a motion for the board to consider be it ordered that based on the material submitted in the application of the town of Cape Elizabeth to amend the community center site plan located at 343 Ocean House <coughs> Road change the use of the second floor of the office building from residential to office be approved. That second? Second. All in favor? Okay, thank you. That's approved. The next item on the consent agenda is the Golden Ridge Subdivision Approval Extension. K and K Realty is requesting an extension of the minor subdivision approval granted for the three lot Golden Ridge subdivision located on Golden Ridge Lane under section 16-2-3C subdivision ordinance. Again, uh, anyone have a desire to put this on the regular agenda? Okay, hearing none, uh, do we have a motion? Yes, Barbara. Motion for the board to consider be it ordered that based on the facts presented, the request of K&K &K Realty to extend the minor subdivision approval of the three lot Golden Ridge subdivision located on Golden Ridge Lane, 90 days to June 14, 2004, be approved. We have a second. Second. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor? Okay. So that extension is approved. All right, the next item under old business is the Nedwell Private Access Way Permit. This is a request for a private access way permit for a lot adjacent to 3 South Street. Um, and we'll hear from the applicant, and then we'll uh, open the public hearing. Good evening, uh, Mr. Good evening. Chairman and members of the board. Uh, my name is Owens McCullough, a civil engineer uh, with Sebago Technics here tonight on behalf of the applicant. Uh, Philip Nedwell is also here if the board had any questions of the applicant. Uh, when we were last before the board, it was for a completeness review, um, at which time uh, the project was deemed complete. There were some conditions that we uh, addressed for the town engineer's review. We have made those changes to the plan. Uh, which is reflected in the drawings you have. Uh, also, I believe Barbara ac uh, accurately indicated that we had an misquoted the zoning space and bulk requirements. Uh, thank you for that. So we changed that too. Um, also, um, uh, then we did resubmit uh, to the planning board for that. So we're here tonight for the public hearing. Uh, Maureen has prepared a uh, staff uh, review letter. A uh, couple of the items in there, uh, one of them, uh, the Public Works uh, Director has requested that the sewer extension uh, be taken over and maintained by the town with an easement uh, granted to the Public Works Department, and the applicant is certainly agreeable to that. As the board uh, may recall, as part of this project, which is an extension of uh, South Street, approximately 200 feet along this lot right here, uh, the Nedwells currently live here. Uh, the road ends about right here. Uh, they own property adjacent to it and are proposing a new house lot there. Uh, that requires the extension uh, or the private way, access way waiver. 
Uh, so we extend the road. Uh, the road would be 18 feet in width with ditches on each side of it. It would be a gravel surfaced road. As part of that, uh, sewer service needed to be extended up. There was some older sewer services that ran up through. I think there was two of them. Uh, the public works director asked that we replace the sewer with a new 8-inch sewer, uh, tie in the old services that exist, and then the public works would like to take that over uh, for the town to maintain. So it's designed and installed to the town standards. Uh, another item that uh, came out of the last meeting was the fire chief uh, preferred that we did not use the driveway as a turnaround. Um, if there were vehicles parked in here and there was an emergency, they may not be able to turn around. Uh, we agreed with that and have constructed or proposing to construct a turnaround dislocation here, uh, which would be solely dedicated as a turnaround for the project. Um, in addition, uh, we also received some uh, comments today from an abutter who uh, retained um, Dana Morton, PE, uh, to do a review of the private way plan. And I believe that memorandum, I think, made it to the board. Um, it's certainly uh, with Maureen, and I'd like to take a couple of minutes to go through that. Uh, I had an opportunity to speak with Dana uh, Morton today, um, and uh, subsequent to that conversation, we actually did make uh, one change to the plan uh, that I felt uh, made uh, good sense and good design sense. And that is that um, this abutter over here had an 8-inch culvert under their driveway. We were extending the road up, and there was some concern expressed that uh, with this additional road running the drainage down into this 8-inch culvert uh, may be unadvised, it may not be uh, the right thing to do. Um, I actually looked at the, the ditching and the drainage and agreed uh, that that should be upsized to a 12-inch storm drain. I've spoken to the applicant, and he is willing to do that. Uh, so we certainly appreciate um, uh, that comment, I think it will actually be uh, make for a better project. Uh, there were a couple of other questions that I'd like to try to respond to. Um, along the, uh, and I'll read the questions and then uh, go ahead and respond to them. Along the Steinberg frontage, will the 18-foot travelway be located in the center of the 50-foot street right away as indicated? Uh, our design, which is this piece of the road here, as you may recall, the only the, the excavation that we're going to do in this section of the street is for the sewer. And our proposal is not to move the road, to leave the road where it is um, in the street. We will be excavating in the street to put the sewer in. And when that's done, uh, we'll regrade the road. The applicant will regrade the road. And if you've been down there, the road is very flat, not much of a crown to it. And Dana accurately indicated that we ought to make sure that we get a crown to it. And that is what we're proposing to do on the road. Put a crown back in the road so you get the drainage off the road and it's not a sink uh, in the middle of the road. But we will leave the road where it is, uh, but it will be excavated to put the sewer in and then regraded. Uh, the next question was not considering any requirements for paving. Does the typical street section indicated meet the town construction specifications for future acceptance as a town way? Uh, the answer to that is no. This is designed as a private access way, so it's only being designed to that standard in the ordinance. If the applicant or somebody else in the future came in there and wanted to build, do a subdivision or, or, or go for public acceptance, that road would have to be improved to the uh, typical street section uh, for the ordinance. So we're proposing to do the 18-foot wide private access way standard for the roadway. Uh, the next question was, after the new sewer is installed, will a typical street section indicated be constructed, A, along the Steinberg frontage, and B, to Stephenson Street? And the answer to that is, this I think I pretty much answered it in question one, but um, the answer to that is, is we're not proposing to, to increase the width of that street. It, it's right around 18 feet. Uh, we're not proposing to move it or alter it other than when we excavate it, it has to be regraded and when we regrade it, it makes sense to put a crown to that road so that the surface is improved and gets the drainage off the road. We think it'll make it more passable. Uh, the part B of it dealt with drainage. Uh, will the new and rebuilt portions of South, South Street be adequately crowned? Again, 
um, we sort of talked about that, but we will crown. It's the right thing to do. That road is really needs it. So, uh, in front of the Steinberg property is a drainage swell within the right of way, um, adequately pitched in size so that surface water will not run across the property, and visually acceptable and easily maintained. Uh, the answer to that is much out there right now, I believe, because there's no crown in the road. Some of the water actually sheets across the road. When we build it, uh, we're going to put a crown to it. We're going to put ditches that are about 18 inches in depth, not excessive, but uh, about 18 inches in depth, and we're going to replace that culvert. So that should improve the hydraulic carrying capacity of the ditch and keep the water going down to the main culvert. There's a 24-inch culvert that runs underneath South Street here, and all that drainage ends up into that culvert crossing and then off the site. So we're going to make sure that we ditch this appropriately and replace the culvert uh, with a bigger uh, culvert in there. An 8-inch culvert, uh, well, it's below 12-inch culvert to run subject, uh, subject to plugging, um, it becomes a small opening, so it is the right thing to do to go to a bigger culvert. And um, that's really the extent of of those and we do appreciate those comments and we've tried to address those uh, within the design. In fact, I gave, made some changes to the plan and I've given Maureen uh, a copy of those plans and uh, Dana's here tonight in the audience and I gave him a copy too because we felt that we should get it into the record. Great. So just to clarify then, the, the changes that you instituted after speaking with Mr. Morton are now reflected in the revised plan which we got this evening. That's correct. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, with that, uh, we're here tonight uh, for the public hearing and hopefully to move forward with the project. And I probably have talked long enough, so I'll uh, try to answer any questions the board has. Thank you. Before we open the public hearing, does anyone have any questions at this point? Yes, Barbara. Thank you for making the change on the plans. However, I'm afraid there's still a minor error. Okay. And the error is that you, the, um, somebody transposed the side yard setback and the rear yard setback. The side yard setback, which is the last one, should be 10 feet, and the rear yard setback is 15 feet. Somebody just put them in the wrong order. Thank you. Well, we're almost got it. <laughs> Thanks, Tom. Any other questions before we open the public hearing? Okay. Um, thank you. Thank I'm you. sure we'll be back to you. Uh, at this point, we'd like to open the public hearing on the Nedwell Private Access Way permit. If there's anyone that would like to speak, please uh, approach the podium and identify yourself, and uh, we'd be happy to hear what you have to say. Okay. Hearing none, we'll close the public hearing. Um, and again, uh, if anyone has questions of the applicant on the application. Yes. I would just like to compliment you for handling that letter so rapidly and effectively. Thank you. Okay. Um, Maureen, have you reviewed the plans and they address the issues? Yeah, the applicant called me, uh, Mr. Owens called me this, this afternoon and said he had uh, spoken with Dana Morton, who is the engineer who is representing the Steinbergs. I also spoke with Mr. Morton this afternoon, and they have come to an agreement. Um, Mr. McCullough has revised plans. Uh, he knows the board is reluctant to receive plans the night of the meeting, so he's prepared three sets to show his good faith effort in revising the plans. And I've looked at them, I've looked at the plan, and it looks like everything he's asked for has been revised as described uh, in Mr. Morton's letter. Okay. Sure. Yeah, go to the podium and please identify who you are. My name is Dana Morton, and I'd like to thank Owens for responding also. That was, that, it was very good. I, I believe that Mr. Steinberg is satisfied. One question for the applicant is, how long will the road be messed up uh, with the sewer work? Will, will he be able to get in all the time? Yes. There might be a period of 
six hours so that it's not accessible. Right. Yep. Thanks. It's a typical reward. That's all. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Morton. <clears throat> Any other questions of the board? Yes. Um, I have a question for Maureen on the, uh, uh, it said the, uh, the maintenance agreement was being reviewed by the town attorney and we were going to have comments for tonight. When I left the office at 410 this afternoon, I hadn't received anything. I, there could be something sitting in, in front of the fax machine as we speak. I, I would request in, in lieu of actually having those comments that if we could just make another condition uh, to any motion for approval that a maintenance agreement be submitted in a in a form acceptable to the town attorney. And I assume if he has any issues, it's going to be very minor and very easy to revise. Sure. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So, Maureen, you haven't heard one way or the other if the fans are any good. Um, Tim, attorney's office hours are till 5, and our office hours till 4. So, you know, I, I wouldn't be surprised if there's a letter sitting upstairs in okay. front of the fax machine that I haven't seen yet. All right. Well, I think we can address that. <coughs> Anything else? Any other questions? You ready for a motion? Dave? I have a motion for the board to consider. Findings of fact. One, Philip and Darlene Nedwell are requesting a private access way permit to build on the lot at the end of the existing end of South Street, which requires review under section 19-7-9. Two, town ownership of the proposed sewer line will facilitate maintenance and service for sewer users in the future. Three, the application sub substantially complies with section 19-7-9 private access ways in section 19-8-3, resource protection regulations. Therefore, be it ordered that, based on the plans and material submitted and the facts presented, the application of Philip and Darlene Nedwell for a private access way permit to build on the lot located at 5 South Street, U29-51D, be approved subject to the following conditions. One, that ownership of the 8-inch sewer line be to be constructed in South Street be conveyed to the town with an appropriate easement reviewed and approved by the town attorney and town manager, and two, that the maintenance agreement be submitted in a, in a form acceptable to the town attorney. We have a second. Second the motion. Moved and seconded. Any further discussion? All in favor? Okay, that's approved. Thank you. Um, I, I do have one announcement to make that I should have done earlier. The April meeting is being rescheduled to the 29th of April at 7 p.m. So for anyone that has something on the agenda and was planning on attending the meeting for the, when was it, for the 20th, it's now scheduled for the 29th. And uh, all submission deadlines for the April meeting will remain the same. Next agenda item is the Pond Cove Edition Cape High School Renovation Site Plan. This also is in order for a public hearing. Uh, first, we will hear from the applicant. Excuse me, Mr. Chairman. Yes. I would like to recuse myself from consideration of this application uh, due to my firm's representation of the school department. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. My name is Tom Greer from Pickham and Greer. I'm the civil engineer in the project. And uh, with me tonight is Paul Powell uh, from HKTA, representing the architectural firm. Uh, based on Maureen's uh, memo, what I'll do is give you a brief overview of the project, keep it relatively brief, tell you about the minor changes that we have made, where we stand, and then um, more detailed questions about any particular area. I have some additional boards that we can talk about those particular areas on site. The uh, 
project as you saw it last time is virtually the same as it is this time there have been very few changes in terms of uh, where parking lots or site amenities have been relocated most of the changes that I went through last time that were raised in the engineers first memo are addressed and in this memo uh, in, in this plan we're entering the site off Route 77. We're going to reconstruct the entrance, so there will be a new entrance drive coming into the, the site. The circle, as you now know it, will disappear, and there will be a new bus drop-off, student drop-off area in front of the school. There are some minor parking lot changes to accommodate that. The front entrance to the school will have about a 1,000 square foot addition to it, and a new presence for the entrance will be in place. There will be a plaza in front of the school that will be a concrete plaza to give you um, a warm, welcoming feeling. And when you drive on site, we'll create a new entrance that we think will guide, guide visitors much better than, than the current site. Um, at the gym entrance, there will be a new access road in uh, ADA-compliant walkway that goes down to the gym entrance and some additional landscaping down in that area. The current student parking lot will be expand, expanded to provide some additional parking spaces in that location. Uh, essentially, it's 60 feet wide. We're, we're going to make it 120 feet wide to not quite double the number of spaces in that area. The back area of the school will have some additional parking on it as well, as shown here in the white areas, where that will be um, a significant amount of parking added. Currently, there is some gravel parking down in this area. It's going to be replaced with a paved parking area. There is going to be a new water line service that will come in around the building and provide some fire protection in the back. Um, this soccer field here that, that you can see just on the very top of the photo will be reconstructed so that it will meet a regulation size, essentially lengthening it out uh, some 30 yards or so. <coughs> the width is, is acceptable width for current soccer fields. We'll also be adding onto the cafeteria approximately uh, 1,500 square feet of cafeteria space so that lunches can be done uh, in a more timely fashion. And in front of the area and through here, there'll be a, a few, uh, four picnic tables and a little bit of an outdoor plaza gathering area created that, that we think will be a very nice amenity to the back of the school. We're also adding a walkway between the two parking lots on the lower side that will have some stairs between them to allow better pedestrian access in the back. At Pond Cove School, we'll be adding approximately 8,800 8, square feet, which will be for kindergarten classrooms, as well as some teachers' room and prep <coughs> um, And that will require relocating the walkway around the Pond Cove School area, and uh, that will require some storm drainage improvements in that area. And again, there's a landscape plan that goes along with that. The construction schedule requires that the Pond Cove School be bid first, and we're hoping to get that out to bid here very shortly and uh, receive bids somewhere around the end of April, uh, 1st of May. The high school itself is under a construction management program and will be done starting in the middle of the summer, and that will be done piece by piece under the construction manager. Um, and we're going to work on the inside of the building first, and then the site components will be constructed in the uh, summer of 2005 uh, to minimize school disruptions and, and manage the project overall. Uh, in, in that terms, that gives you a pretty good idea of what the outside of the, uh, the, the project is. We have made a slight change in the walkway and the plaza up here in the front of the school. Shown in this drawing, this is the front entrance as it will be reconstructed. Um, and we'll be adding some trees along the, uh, along the uh, entranceway here. Uh, we have added a walkway that comes from the middle of the plaza back around and comes back up into the top part of the plaza to provide an ADA compliant route to get from the, from the curb to the doors. There are a series of steps here in the middle. Those have been narrowed up slightly and uh, um, in the plaza reconfigured just slightly to, to accommodate that walkway going around. I've had the opportunity to go through uh, the memos, uh, Maureen's memo in particular, uh, all of the landscaping suggestions that, that she has made in there. Uh, we intend to, to comply with, which will require adding some street trees along the entrance. 
and um, check some species of, of trees by Pond Cove School, and that will occur. Uh, she has asked for uh, consideration of lights along the entrance way that are compatible to the town center lights that are required, and we'll be changing uh, these fixtures here along the driveway to accommodate that, that, that request. The lights that are there now we had intended to reuse. We're likely to relocate those to this rear parking lot so that we reuse them back in, back in that area. We still intend on using the existing light poles that are in this parking lot and just reconfigure those, those particular ones. We have uh, also taken a look at uh, Steve Harding's memo. Most of his were uh, detailed comments, um, changes in the storm drain and that type of thing, and we, will, we can accommodate most of those changes have already been made or will be made by the time the final, final sets of drawings are available to the, to the planning board. With that, I would be happy to open it up to the public, and then we can have a couple of issues that we need to talk about. Um, okay. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Griff. We'll, well, I'm sure we'll be back to you. Okay, this is uh, scheduled this evening for a public hearing. Uh, I would ask anyone that wishes to speak to speak from the, the podium and identify yourself, uh, your name and address, and uh, we'd be happy to take your comments. Good evening. Good evening, Chief. Uh, Neil Williams, Chief of Police. Um, looking at this plan, um, I just wish the board to look at one situation that uh, affects public safety that uh, we're concerned about, and that would be the entrance to the high school at 77. Um, over the years, and I can say that uh, several years, um, I personally and my predecessor, Chief Pickering, received several complaints about uh, waiting in, in line at the high school for, you know, a, a delay in the, in the traffic and whatnot. And as we've done surveys, uh, we've done a survey uh, January 29, 2003, and uh, myself and the town manager did one on April 4, 2001. We find that there's a delay of about three minutes and some odd seconds. Uh, I think it was in the 2001, it was like three minutes and 11 seconds, and in the 2003, I found the, the maximum, that is, wait, uh, three, three minutes and 45 seconds. Um, we have received, like I said, several complaints on this. Um, we, we did try to look at uh, several different options. We know that taking the school bus would probably be one option, but I've been told that that is totally out of the picture. Um, so we looked, uh, there was a board that was formed, I think on the advice of uh, town manager Michael McGovern. And so we came up with a pilot project on April 18, 2003, and that was to open the uh, Jordan Way access. That's been somewhat of a help from what I understand, but that is not a solution to the problem. I think that now that this plan now comes before the board there's a solution to the problem and um, that could be a traffic light at that particular intersection. Uh, I don't know where it stands as far as the town goes or where uh, the school project goes but uh, I would like to uh, throw this before the board and say that that's an option that should be looked at. Okay. Thank you. Good evening, Chairman Seralvo and members of the Planning Board. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to come before you tonight, and I thank you for that. My name is Marianne Lynch, and I live at 2 Old Colony Lane. I am a member of the Town Council, and I've been a member of this school building committee for the last two years. But I appear before you tonight only as a member of the school building committee and as a parent of one 18-year-old teenage driver 
a second 15-year-old son who is soon to have his learner's permit, and so you are all warned about that, and an 11-year-old who no doubt soon will be driving, much sooner than I'd like. Um, I want to emphasize that I am not here tonight speaking for the council. I speak only as one counselor and as one parent, so these are strictly my views. I appreciate all the work that the school board, the school department, and the school building committee has done to bring this project to the point where it is tonight. And I'm not here to seek delay of this project, which I have supported. But I am here to talk about traffic and to ask that you condition your approval of the project upon compliance with the town's ordinance traffic standard and to specifically require the necessary traffic improvements cited by the town's traffic consultant in a study completed in December 2003. I know that you have that study. The town council sent that study to you, I think, um, earlier this year. It's the so-called Wilbur Smith Associate Report, um, which reports on traffic in the center of town. In short, that report concluded that at peak travel times, the intersection at the high school and Route 77 provide a level of service of F. A being excellent service, B and C are considered acceptable. F is the lowest classification that an intersection can receive. Because the level of service F um, was determined by Wilbur Smith, uh, they recommended that the town um, construct a left turn lane and a light at the intersection. <coughs> As you know, the town ordinance requires that if an intersection is functioning at a level of service of D or lower prior to the development, the project cannot reduce the current level of service. The ordinance further provides that all access to and from the development shall be safe and convenient. The ordinance also has a volumetric test for intersections functioning at a level of service of C or greater. I do not believe that such volumetric test is necessarily applicable where the level of service is already an F. I had not planned to appear before you tonight um, until the school building committee, until the uh, school building committee meeting just of a week or two ago when we saw the traffic report submitted by the. Um, schools consultants, um, and I understand that report had been submitted to you before the school building committee had a chance to look at it. Um, without any supporting data that I could see, the consultant concluded that the proposed renovations and modifications are not expected to result in any new trips to the campus and thus presumably not reducing the level of service. Such conclusion is totally unsupported by the school department's current population projections. In the 2000-2001 school year, the high school enrollment was 494 students. This year, enrollment is 494 in 2000. This year, enrollment is 540 students, or at least it was as of September. Planning decisions, a population projection consultant hired by the school department this past spring for this very project recommended that in the future a bandwidth of plus or minus 5% be used around all population projections. Planning decisions has projected a high school population of 590 students in 2005-2006 school year. Obviously, with the five, plus or minus 5% range, that brings the number potentially up to 620 students. Simply put, the school department expects an increase of between 50 to 80 students in the next two years. I know personally that this is happening. I have a son in the 10th grade so-called bulge class. We have a large 8th grade class arriving next year. By 2005, the school population will have grown by almost 100 students since 1997, and perhaps more if that plus 5% bandwidth turns out to be uh, more accurate. Many of these students will drive themselves to school or their parents will drive them to school. It defies logic to say that this project will not result in any new trips. 
If the school grows from 498 high school students to 620, or even 590, there will be a significant number of new trips generated by this project. If a volumetric test is determined to be applicable, I believe that this increase in student population will trigger the 100 new trips under the ordinance since there were 83 new trips determined to be generated since 97. You can make whatever assumptions you want, but if you have 83 new trips and you add another almost 100 or 100 plus students, um, you're easily going to trigger that 100 plus um, volumetric test. The conclusion that no improvements are necessary at the intersection does a disservice to the safety of our student population, not to mention the drivers who are merely uh, through traffic drivers on Route 77. There's no question that if we were dealing with a private developer, the planning process would require the improvements necessary to improve the level of service at that intersection to an acceptable level. This should also be the case when the town or the school department is the developer as well. Indeed, if we're not prepared to apply our own ordinances to the town and the school, then um, I don't think we should be applying them to the private sector either. I want to make clear, though, I don't want to hold the high school project hostage to the construction of a light and a turn lane. It's my hope that the planning board will require a light and a turn lane as recommended by the town's consultant as a condition of approving the project. This can be done, as you well know, without entailing any delay in the project. The project could be permitted to move forward with a condition that a light be constructed within a time certain, for instance, within 24 or 36 months of the start date of the project. Uh, make no mistake, I'm not here because I want a light. I cherish the rural character of this town as much as the next person. But I don't think it's a question of whether we want a light or not. Based on the consultant's report, we need a light. And we need a light at that intersection, both for public convenience and public safety. How much such improvements would be, how much such, how such improvements would be funded or how much it would cost is not something that the planning board needs to consider. But for the record, I want to state publicly that if a light is required, then I will seek to have the council apply for a grant and or to increase the borrowing on the project, as opposed to having it come from the amount already approved by the voters. Also, the town manager believes that there is a possibility that a grant for 80% of the cost um, could be uh, received thus leaving a net cost of $30,000. So this question really isn't or shouldn't be about money. The bottom line is that we've studied this problem. The intersection has the worst traffic grade possible. Traffic experts have made a recommendation for a light and a turn lane. Our most inexperienced drivers use that intersection every day. And when the moms and dads drive their children to and from school, we have our most precious cargo in the car. Plain and simple, it's a safety issue. The school board has um, contacted the council on several occasions about the intersection. As the chief um, has recounted to you, we have tried to um, experiment with having a separate access at Jordan Way. It's helped the situation but it's clearly not a solution. We have before us a seven plus million dollar project and it would be penny wise and pound foolish to ignore a hundred and sixty thousand dollar road safety improvement for the entrance to the high school. It's my view that if the planning board does not require the necessary improvements now, this issue will not be revisited again until something tragic happens. And I certainly hope that's not the case. Again, I want to thank you for the opportunity to come before you. Um, I appreciate your dedicated service to the town. I often tell people that I think um, that it's much harder to be on the planning board than to be on the town council. So um, I really do appreciate your service. And I trust that with your um, experience and expertise um, that you will um, bring good judgment to bear on this um, 
project. So thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> Anyone else for the public hearing? Okay, we'll close the public hearing. Mr. Greer, uh, and let me say too that I, I hope uh, we still have the opportunity and we will may recognize some other people that are here to provide us for some information uh, that may or may not have spoken at the, at the public hearing. So beware. Uh, sure. um, does the board have questions? Yes. Maureen. Thank you. I just wanted the board to note that uh, Phil DeLeon, who's sitting way back in the corner there, is representing Wilbur Smith Associates tonight in case the planning board has questions about the, the traffic study that was prepared for the town council. Uh, I, I guess, Mr. Greer, my first question would be, uh, given the information on the traffic issues at, at the intersection uh, and the fact that it has been and we know as a board that it has been an ongoing issue for quite a while. Uh, has the applicant considered any alternatives or ways to address the problem that you feel would be uh, acceptable? The, uh, the committee has talked about this issue and um, I think the general consensus is is that there is a problem and everybody recognizes that um, the report both traffic reports uh, put the level of service at F and that's not going to change significantly um, it's my understanding that this issue is going to go before the town council and the school board this Thursday to review it in more detail and it's hoped that a solution will come out of that meeting and we can come back to the board with a better solution. The difference between the two reports in terms of what's the recommended solution, uh, one is recommending a minimum of a left-hand turn lane into the site to help ease some of that congestion, while the second traffic <coughs> report is going one step further and asking for a traffic light at that, at that intersection for the users of the site that are high school students or our parents dropping off high school students, um, the solution appears to be just a light. Um, for the rest of the community, um, a light doesn't appear to be what's really what they would like to see there, but, but may best serve the community as a whole <coughs> to put a light in there. Um, I can't stand here and tell you that it's the light is going to be part of this project from the budget point of view it was not in there and so the building committee working through its channels can't just <coughs> add a light without having some direction from both the school board and or the town council to make to make that change so we're we're working through that issue we think we're going to have a solution be able to come back to you in april with a solution that that will be acceptable to the board but i can't tell you what it's going to be at this point Okay. Uh, just speaking for myself, uh, we obviously were charged with the responsibility for any project to look at the adequacy and safety of traffic uh, that is ingress or egress to the project. So that's something we have to have to look at. Now, we don't, and many times won't necessarily decide what. The, which appropriate solution uh, is best, but we certainly uh, have to make a decision as to whether something has to be done to regulate or to address traffic problems at, at an intersection. And we'll certainly look at that issue here as well. But I would certainly encourage the building committee and the town council and the school board if they can come up with a solution that we can all agree on. Uh, then that would certainly make things make things easier and make things move along a bit faster. Uh, so uh, I, I'm glad that that you're pursuing that, and we 
look forward to hearing some, some alternatives, uh, although I still would like to explore some of these issues further uh, tonight, but we'll go on to other questions. If there are any other questions of Mr. Greer, yes. Dave? Well, I, I have one question while we're still on a traffic issue. Uh, as, as a taxpayer I, I, and, a, and a planning board member, it's always hard to be on a planning board when there's a political problem like this. But I have a question of Chief Williams. Maybe you can answer it. Just to help us in the future make that decision, would that would the traffic light be operative all the time on a stop and go, or would it only be through the rush hour periods? I believe there's several different um, scenarios it could be, but uh, the one that I heard was uh, placing loops in the roadway. So if there was no traffic on the access road coming out of the high school, it would stay green on okay. 77. So, so it would be would, a working light? Correct. Okay. And uh, that would also help out on sporting events and uh, plays and whatever is else at the high school that we have. So it would be automatic and it wouldn't have to be tended? Correct. Good. Thanks. <clears throat> Any other questions? I'd like to uh, ask a question of Mary Ann, if I, if I could follow up to uh, Josanne. And I, I beg your indulgence. This is my first night on the planning board, the first time I've dealt with this pile of material. Um, and I'm not even familiar with the town, part of the town uh, regulations that you referred to requiring uh, consideration of safety upgrades if. Um, if a project brings a, a uh, safety classification from D to worse or uh, causes deterioration of a safety thing. My question for you, though, is um, is the expansion of the high school really a causative factor in the population increase in the traffic increase? The traffic increase is, is really caused by the enrollment increase, which is going to be there whether or not we, we um, expand the high school. I'm not opposed to the to the uh, improvement in safety, but I wonder whether we have to have them so closely coupled that one is dependent on the other being solved. Well, I view the project as being done to accommodate the expanded population. Um, I mean, we could get into a chicken and egg debate over, but but the uh, but we have kindergarten kids in the high school. Um, we're moving them because the high school needs to expand. The I, I, I don't disagree with, with, with uh, what your arguments yeah. and the improve, improvements in safety needed. What I'm asking is whether it's possible to decouple them and I, maybe agree that the project itself is not the causative factor. For that's, that's not my reading of the um, ordinance that you have to apply. My reading is you have to apply a traffic standard to all developments, and this development um, brings with it more parking. I mean, you know, if we didn't have parking, if we said we're going to put all the kids on buses and make them take the bus, um, you wouldn't perhaps need to. In fact, maybe then one could say there are, there are no addi additional tricks. But the fact of the matter is that that's not the way the school has chosen to um, do things. They're, they are adding parking. The kids do drive to school, sophomores, juniors, seniors. There, are, there will be more drivers. Um, so I don't see it as something that's permitted, but I'm sure that Maureen and others are there to advise you. And again, I am speaking for myself and as a parent as, and as I read the ordinance, but you all have more expertise in the ordinance than I do. Peter. I mean, the way I look at it is the analogy you gave earlier. If this were a private developer improving and increasing, say, uh, a strip mall in there and all the same traffic factors were there, uh, it doesn't seem to me that there would be any close question, given the circumstance that's out there, that you would require that developer to bring the entrance way up to current standards, even if it had been built in, what, 1969? when the high school was built the first time. I mean, yeah. looking at it that way, I don't even see that that's a close question. Yeah, I, and again, just to, to clarify, um, and Maureen can correct me as she so often does if I'm wrong, but we have many times had projects come before us where what is requested in and of itself 
doesn't create the issue that needs to be corrected but the project the site <coughs> is already uh, not in compliance or exceed some sort of limitation and we have to require that it be brought into compliance or within whatever limitation it is regardless of whether this particular application affects that issue or not so uh, you know whether it's due to this particular change really isn't the issue if the condition exists we're required to make sure that it, it complies. That. And that's been the board's practice. Um, you know, I think of a subdivision you just recently approved where the amount of stormwater generated by that particular subdivision was not significant enough for a detention basin, but in, in re-looking at the whole catchment area, it was determined that the uh, adja adjacent area had undersized their uh, detention area, and so this project built a detention basin to accommodate both itself and the deficiency that had been identified. So in that, in that example, there was a stormwater issue where an existing deficiency was corrected. Right. And frankly, in this project, as Peter has pointed out in the past, the, the parking issue is something that had to be addressed. So um, anyway, we digress. Uh, any other questions, David? Well, while we're still in <coughs> the traffic, um, I, I kind of get the impression earlier that, that we have to make this decision tonight. But then listening to Mr. Greer, I think if I understood him correctly, they are going to discuss this at your meeting. You're also going to discuss it with the town council, or was it the building committee? Uh, my understanding it is the school board and the town council. Okay. We're going to discuss that. So Did that signal right? Uh, I, I'm not sure. As to what their thoughts are, I'd like to to wait until they finish their meeting. Maybe uh, maybe they'll find another solution to it that would help us make a decision. Well, sure. As you know, we always have the option to we can act tonight, we right. can approve, we cannot approve, or we can table. So um, we'll certainly address that, uh, Barbara. I certainly appreciate that we have a problem at certain times of day, and I think we need to, need to make that clear at the entrance to the school. And I'm sure in their wisdom, the committee will consider a variety of solutions and come up with the one that is both, both I hope, cost effective and best for the town. And look at not just, do we put in a traffic light? Do we do this or that? But which is the best solution for the town in its entirety? Um, to the problem. So I think we have to leave it in the hands of the plant of the council and the committee and hope they come back with a variety of ideas for us to consider. And we'll certainly consider them. But they, they do have to bring it into compliance. I mean, whatever solution they present to us, again, like any other applicant, has to improve it to the level that the ordinance requires. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I, you know, we... <clears throat> uh, again, we could decide that nothing is required and the plan in and of itself is sufficient. I frankly couldn't support that. Mm. If we decide that something is required to address the traffic issue, uh, we would <coughs> certainly be willing to hear what the different options are. We, we don't have to say it has to be one thing versus, versus another, but hopefully we will be presented with an alternative that, that we can... That, that we can use. Um, unless anyone else has any questions for Mr. Greer right now, I'd like to actually have Mr. DeLeon, is it DeLeon, DeLeon um, who I believe participated in the, the traffic study for the town. Thank you for coming. You're welcome. My name is Phil DeLeon with Wilbur Smith Associates. Uh, we're based out of Portland. <coughs> Um, Mr. DeLeon, I, I've gotten the traffic study. I've read it. Um, well, I've been on the planning board for a while, but traffic studies aren't always the easiest thing for me to follow. So for my benefit, and maybe everyone else is here, if you can give us the, the layman's version of what you found and what your recommendations are, and perhaps we may have some questions for you. Okay. I will try to make it simple and, and as short as I can. 
Uh, basically, we were contacted by the town to perform a traffic analysis uh, that included the intersection of 77 and the high school drive. As part of that, we went out and did a 12-hour traffic count um, because we wanted to get a clear uh, vision of, you know, when traffic occurred out there as opposed to, you know, trying to define exactly when we thought peak was and when it wasn't. Uh, actually, the 12-hour count, I can tell you what we saw from that, which was done in September of last year, determined that the morning peak uh, was between 6.45 and 7.45 a.m., and the p.m. peak is actually between 5 and 6 in the afternoon. Uh, so it isn't when school lets out, but it's more uh, as you have traffic on 77, plus you have activities coming out of the high school and activities coming out of the community center. Um, taking that information and data, then what we did is we uh, processed that through um, the Institute of Traffic Engineer, uh, the MUTCD, uh, the other uh, documentation that's out there that kind of governs the uh, traffic engineering world uh, to look at what we call signal warrants. Uh, there are certain criteria that are established on a, a national level to evaluate whether a traffic signal is warranted and basically falls under, I believe it's now been consolidated, but it's eight different categories. We looked at all of those categories. Um, we found that this intersection meets the criteria in two of the eight categories. And those categories are one, the peak hour, um, and also the four-hour uh, traffic volumes. Uh, so there was no question in our mind that um, a traffic signal is warranted in this location or um, something else that at least will uh, address that issue. Uh, as was indicated previously, um, you know, we've determined that it's a level of service of F, that it operates at that during those peak hour time frames. Uh, if you actually look at our study, um, I know the chief mentioned the, the turning movements on 77. We also looked at the movements coming out of the high school, the left turn movements. Uh, and if you look at that, yes, we're approaching, I think, delays almost four minutes per vehicle during peak hour, the worst case, uh, which I think, again, as the counselor kind of indicated, uh, I don't think that's something you necessarily want uh, high school um, people trying to do, say, again, if you recognize that the PM is during rush hour. I mean, so it's not only involving you, it's involving students and others at 5 to 6 PM. Um, again, based on that, too, it's not just that it needs a signal or some other control mechanism at that intersection. We also have recommended in the determination that you need to do something on Route 77 as far as a left turn lane or something uh, through there. Um, without, again, based on existing volumes, we did not even do any projections based on any growth in the community, any expansion to the high school. Everything was based on those existing traffic volumes as of September. So uh, I hope that gives you uh, some uh, clarification as far as what our study evaluated and what we came up with. I, I guess I have, a, I have a question on the, are there different criteria that support the signal and, and the left turn lane separately or do those things go together or what is it that you found that you thought required the left turn lane in addition to the signal? Uh, again, it's, it's an overall, as far as an intersection, uh, how the intersection operates you know, during the peak hour. So yes, the left turn is, is actually part of the whole operating uh, evaluation of the intersection. So the purpose of that, I assume, is so that traffic along 77 can keep moving while at times when people are waiting to turn into the high school? Correct. I mean, you know, obviously there are uh, other communities in the, the state of Maine that uh, what they do is they use, uh, you know, police officers to control traffic during uh, school 
hours, you know, the morning and the afternoon, that type of thing. Um, which again, if you don't have significant volumes on the through road or enough issues, then you know that works fairly well. But again, that tends to tie up, um, you know, other other operating factors of the intersection. And then getting back to David's earlier question, when when you have a situation where the the signal is required for certain times of day and not for others. How is that addressed, or how did you recommend that be addressed? We haven't addressed it at this point. Again, it's more of a design issue and what you know you feel or what uh, the analysis is. Uh, typically, when you go in and do the design on a traffic signal, and again, since this is a state road, um, you know, Maine DOT would be uh, the review agency as far as that. But you submit um, signal timing uh, to the department on what needs to be done based on that information. So again, what you would have is you may have it as set as, as pre-timed um, green and red for you know certain movements during the peak hour. You could then get a controller, which is the box that goes over on the corner, uh, but then you could do peak hour and you could do a different adjustment either so it's set time or as the chief indicated, you could do uh, loop detectors in the roadway that then would trigger, you know, um, a timing mechanism on when the light would turn. Okay. Any other questions? Anyone else? Thank you. Thank you for coming. You're welcome. Um, I know at the last meeting and at the workshop, we did have some questions about the, not to cut off any other questions on the traffic issue, but the internal movement of the traffic in terms of buses and so forth. Does anyone have any further questions of Mr. Greer on that issue? It appears from the plan that the buses and the cars are going to be in the same direction, which is going to create a huge bottleneck. Well, Since we, I understand, I have yeah, no personal knowledge sure. of this, that many, many people take their children to school. We can't seem to encourage children to take the buses. That's correct. And on the flip side of that, there are very few buses. And I think that's the, that's the combination why we think this is going to work. Um, we just finished a renovation at Yarmouth High School. And it's a very similar situation where the front of the school has bus drop-off as well as student drop-off. The time delay for a bus to stop, turn its lights on, empty the bus and get out um, really is a very minor inconvenience. Most parents know when they see it going in um, and are willing to put up with that and it's there for a very short period of time. There are some few buses on this drop-off on this campus that it really doesn't warrant having separate bus drop-off lane and a separate parent drop-off lane uh, to, to do that. Um, based on the experience up in Yarmouth, we think it's going to work just fine. Um, is it an inconvenience? Yes. Will it encourage parents to put their son or child, their child on the bus? Maybe. We hope so. <laughs> that's where they, where they maybe ought to be. Uh, but, but we think that's going to work okay. As Maureen pointed out in her memo, in her memo um, this parking lot here uh, has a walkway that we're constructing that, that comes uh, across from the main entrance. Uh, it comes all the way up through the parking lot and along the side. Um, if there was a bus in front of you, you can go in here, stop in the middle of the parking lot, let your student out who has a crosswalk away, and then, and then make the loop back around. Now, I suspect that shortcut will be discovered by parents in a hurry. So there's really a couple of places that will work. The, uh, the issue of the cars <coughs> exiting after dropping students off, it will now go through the parking lot. Is that correct? When you, when you drop a student off here in the front, you will continue down around the loop and then, and then back up through uh, this, this section and up through here. Okay. So and will. does that cross areas where students who park in that parking lot might be walking into the building? Uh, yes, there's a number of um, bollards, uh, wooden guard posts that run all the way along this edge here, and we've provided a crosswalk here to come into this into this area. But if you were a student and parking in here, 
or, or a faculty member, then it's possible for you to cut across the grass really any place in through there and, and, and do that. Or park along these spaces that are on sort of the dog bone and cross. So that traffic will will loop down through and back up through there. Including including the buses. Is that what your question was? I'm sorry? Including the buses. Well, I guess my question went more towards is if, are we adequately satisfied that there there isn't an issue of the students walking across the lane where the cars are going to be exiting? I, I've looked at it. it. I don't think it's any worse than the condition that you have right now. Um, I think we're, we're making it better in respect that we're expanding the student parking lot, and this becomes a student parking lot. So I think most of what you'll see out here are faculty members who arrive uh, earlier than the, than the students. So I think the number of potential pedestrian conflicts there are, are, are somewhat minimized. Um, the more parents who drop students off in the, in the little shortcut loop, then obviously those students have to get to the front entrance, and there is a, a walkway that we've provided, but that walkway does cross that traffic. Mm. Mr. Chairman, the parking lot you're addressing by history of the school has always been a faculty and staff parking lot in the front of the school. Right. <coughs> well, we don't like to see them get run over either. Don't want to see them get run over either. <laughs> Dave. Yeah, the, the issue, as I see it, is uh, congestion coming out of that second entrance that you pointed out. Um, as a parent anxious to get their children to school in their private cars, are going to see that turn around but I think they'll probably take the first one and then loop around and come out where the rest of the vehicles come out. My, my suspicion is if that becomes a, a, a problem, if, then um, someone will need to stand there and say, please drop them off at the drop-off zone and, yep. and go through some parent education classes. Any other questions? Thank you, Mr. Greer. Any other issues? Uh, unless... Are you happy with the parking? That, that's the only issue that I had a letter on. Well, <laughs> I, I don't want to drag it up if I don't have it. <laughs> well, yeah. We were going to discuss the issue on the quantity of spaces. I think there's some dispute um, here according to the... If, yeah, if, if I could understand the letter, I, I would, but maybe Maureen can say <laughs> That's why I passed it off to you, because I... <laughs> but what I've spoken to Mr. Greer about this, and, and you know, we've done what we usually do. We've sat down and we've added up all the different classrooms, and we've calculated how many spaces you need across the entire campus, and it's 1,302. And then we said, okay, the likelihood of fully occupying all the classrooms and having a separate event that fully occupies the assembly space is, is nil. If you're fully occupying the assembly space, you're probably not going to have classes in session. So we said, we're, the argument was that the space that you need to, to, for parking for the assembly space can be shared <coughs> with the space you need for the classrooms. If you do that, uh, we, are, we have a shortage, I think, of 54 spaces. The applicant is adding a couple hundred spaces. The position, the argument the applicant is making, which I think has some weight, but it's up to the board to decide, is that the whole site is in nonconformance to our parking standards now, and that they are bringing it a lot closer to nonconformance and that the actual physical structural additions to the building, um, the, the parking, the additional parking they're providing is far in excess of the uh, parking that would be required just by the square footage of the addition. So they're, they're, they're adding more than they would be required just by the square footage. They're not quite getting to this ordinance, but they're already in noncompliance and they're getting a lot closer. So that, that's, I think that's what you're arguing, Mr. That, that's correct. Our focus is what my letter had pointed out was on event parking. That seems to have been the, um, the trigger in everybody's mind that we don't have enough parking spaces and it's usually centered around an event. And we've added enough spaces to make the event com area in compliance with, with the ordinance if you look at the shared parking option. 
Um, what is not in compliance is just strictly the demand <coughs> based on the high school and the, and the classroom demand, the regular daily demand, and we fall short on that. That parking, we think, can be accommodated with the new parking spaces fairly easy. Right now, um, in the springtime, when sophomores get their license, there's a, there's a problem with parking. They end up parking down in this area down in here. Uh, with the new parking spaces, we think that's going to be fully accommodated. So that from a practical point of view, the day-to-day -day operations of the school, we will have enough parking to give everybody the space. Okay. Any other questions? About, oh, sorry, Dad. Uh, yeah. Just to go along with that, I think we discussed that at, at a workshop, but I, I think my feeling is that I don't think this project should be burdened with an a problem on parking that w existed prior to this project came in that should have been addressed earlier. So, I wouldn't. I wouldn't think I would like. I wouldn't want to see the project held up just because it was short, 53 spaces. I, I, I tend to agree with that. I, also, I think it should be noted that the applicant has has addressed the problem and tried to add many more spaces than are there now. So. It's not as if we're looking at the uh, the prior situation. So, uh, so we can, if we choose to, approve as a non-conforming yeah. use. Yeah, I mean, you're 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 not waiving the standard. You're you're it. I mean, in the past, the board, with an existing site, has been willing to allow an applicant to provide additional parking to comply with new structures. Right. They're going way, well beyond that. So uh, you, could, you could argue that they're, they're meeting the standard with a narrower review of it. Yeah. Well, and within the context of obviously, we, if it's, we think it's a safety problem, we would address it. And obviously, we'd have to think about that. I personally think that the issue has been addressed sufficiently. So. Uh, other questions for the applicant or anyone, anyone else? Uh, do we have a motion as to what we want to do this evening? Dave? A uh, motion for the board to consider. Be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of the town of Cape Elizabeth for site plan review of an addition to Pond Cove Elementary School located in Scott Dyer Road and the renovation of the high school loca located on o Ocean House Road and related improvements be tabled to the regular April meeting of the planning board. Yeah. Um, can we amend the motion to say to the April 29th meeting of the planning board? <laughs> okay. Uh, motion as amended. We have a second. Second, Mr. Chair. Moved and seconded. All in favor? That carries. Thank you. So, uh, again, April 29th is going to be the next uh, meeting. We will be successful. I hope so. I'm sure you will. Thank you. Um, the next item on the agenda is uh, under old business. Is the uh, 
Request by ISIS Development for Site Plan Review of a Mixed Commercial Residential Building proposed at 316 Ocean House Road. And uh, to the board, again, if you remember from the last meeting, I have to recuse myself from uh, this item. So, Mr. Vice Chairman, it's all yours. Uh, the uh, final item on tonight's agenda, ISIS Development uh, is requesting site plan review of Cape Elizabeth Commons, a 15,000 square foot mixed use building to be located at 316 Ocean House Road. The project will, will be reviewed for compliance with section 19-9 site plan regulations and section 19-6-4 town center design requirements. Uh, I would like to uh, begin with asking the applicant uh, to make a presentation on the project and to highlight any changes or additions that uh, have occurred since the last presentation, if any. Thank you. My name is Paul Woods. My, um, I live in Cape Elizabeth. My company, ISIS Development, is the applicant. Um, tonight, um, Tom Saucier from Site Design, the engineer and also the project manager, is here to speak to the board. The primary architect, Mark Singelman, and the landscape architect, uh, Mr. Munch, are not here tonight. They will be here uh, for follow-on meetings with colored drawings for elevations and that type of thing. Um, I'm going to turn this over to Tom, and hopefully you can see um, what we've posted on the board. Thank you. My name is Tom Saucier. I'm a principal of Site Design Consultants, a civil engineering firm in uh, Cumberland. Um, I hope you can see that. I didn't bring an easel tonight, so I gave it a shot. Uh, I'll start out, I'll give a description of the project and what site improvements we're proposing. Um, as it says in the application, it's proposed to be a 5,000 square foot footprint building with mixed use, a uh, total of 15,000 square feet on three stories at a height of uh, 35 feet. The uses included in the building will be retail uses on the first floor, a mixture of retail and office, um, office suites on the second floor, and uh, apartments on the third floor, four apartments is what we're looking at now, uh, three one bedrooms possibly and a two bedroom or some mix like that. I can talk over here. Yes, yes. Yes. All right. The access to the site um, proposed actually dual accesses. This access is currently a one way out um, from the town hall. We propose to widen this and reconfigure it to create a two way access between the town hall and the proposed building. The other access currently serves as access to uh, the site as well as to the condominium development next door. And that also would be proposed as a two-way access um, approved along here. As part of the discussions in the workshop, some of you may recall that we talked about a, a bit of a blind corner in this area. And what we propose to do um, in discussions with Public Works and the town engineer as well is to kind of demark this area. Right now the pavement comes up to the building and we propose to push the edge of this pavement out um, through the use of uh, loam seed mulch or um, pavers or something. Right now it's proposed as loam seed and mulch. The, um, the parking on the site, we've shown in your application 46 spaces. We've done a little fine tuning here and we're down to 45 on the site. Uh, 50 spaces are actually required for the uses um, under your ordinance. As part of the, the town, Paul does have a, uh, an agreement with the town to provide 18 spaces in the municipal lot uh, to serve this development as well. So it gives us access to a total of 63 spaces. Uh, the parking's proposed in this area. We've got a, a row of parking along here with an island separated in the middle per your ordinance. Uh, some parking in front with two handicapped spaces in this area and uh, parking on both sides of the access drive here. We've also proposed three parallel 
parking spaces in this area along the drive out of the town hall. Utilities to serve the development, uh, water is available in the street. We've discussed that with the public works. We'll probably have to open the street to um, obtain water service, and we've talked to them about that, and they're okay with that. <coughs> sewer service as well, depending on the final flows, we may have to replace what is an existing four-inch sewer service here with a six-inch sewer service. And there'll be some relocation of some electrical poles here to here and here in this area. There's a pole right over here that'll need to be relocated. Traffic in your application, you'll see uh, we did a traffic analysis based upon the uses and we've shown that in the peak hour, which would be in the PM peak hour, um, we're looking at around 59 trips, which is well under the DOT threshold of 100 trips. Um, where a traffic permit would be required. <coughs> stormwater, uh, we discussed our stormwater proposal with a town engineer and public works. And what we're proposing is to drain the stormwater away from the building to the rear and away from the building to this area. This area would drain to an enclosed drainage system which would ultimately be tied into the system in Route 77 and outlet it there. The rear system we propose bringing over to a catch basin which is off the corner of Town Hall. And that currently, the town engineer commented that does need replacement and we'll reflect that on the next round of plans that we submit. Landscaping, we don't reflect it on this plan. There's a detailed landscaping plan in your package. Um, it consists of supplementing the existing trees over here which will be preserved with some lilacs in this area and lilacs and yews to the rear. We'll have, we've also proposed in the front of the site, your site plan now shows a five foot concrete walk. The public works director would like a six foot concrete walk in this area with an esplanade with street trees in the esplanade. And then we'd also have some uh, pin oaks along the back of the building in this area. We've provided a photometric plan in the application. Uh, we'll probably refine that a little bit prior to the public hearing. Um, it does demonstrate that the, the light levels at the property line are well within the limits allowed by the ordinance. <clears throat> um, we will have a couple of the street lights um, which match the town standard on the front of the property um, to the back of the sidewalk to light that area. In front of the site, we have a patio area. Where creating what we've been calling a mercantile plaza in this area. It's basically a warm, welcoming area um, into the building off Route 77. We've also proposed a um, paver or textured walk across this area to guide people along the walk from the site to the town hall and back. Underground, we do have some underground propane tanks proposed in this area and a dumpster in this area. Uh, we're calling out now, you may not see on your plan, a six foot high stockade fence around that, a wood stockade fence, and also a stockade fence to the rear of the property um, to replace the one that'll have to be removed as part of this project. And that is the overview. Uh, thank you. Uh, I note that the uh, first order uh, of business for tonight on this application is to determine whether the application is complete. I'm uh, asking if any of the board members have any comments on that on that issue. There, if, and if there are none, would anybody have a motion for the board to consider? Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> motion for the board to consider, be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Iris Development, the site plan review of Cape Elizabeth Commons, a 15,000 square foot mixed use building to be located at 316 Ocean House Road be deemed complete. Second. Okay, a motion has been made and seconded. All, all those in favor? It's unanimous. Uh, at this point, uh, we should uh, discuss whether we would think that a site walk or a public hearing are necessary. Uh, I don't know if anybody has any comments on, on those issues. Barbara. I certainly think we all know the site very well. <laughs> we don't need a site walk. Uh, Maureen, have there been any...
comments? Maybe we should have a public hearing since this is a public I, I, I can tell you that the, the condominium owners who live next door to the site have been in to see me a couple of times who, and, and they're, they're not opposed to the project and, and I believe they're working with the applicant to make sure everybody's happy, but it, it, we should probably have a public hearing if for no other reason to make sure they have an opportunity to speak. I think we should have a public hearing since it's a, in, the, in a public area. I'm inclined to agree with that. Uh, I think it ought to be set, if this would be on the uh, agenda for the April 29th hearing. We, we should be able to cover both items that night too, right? Have a hearing and also finish the business on it. Yeah, the, the board can consider approval yeah. at any point. Good, yeah. Uh, it, just noting the, uh, the uh, town planner's memo, it seems to me you've gotten a preview of coming attractions on some of the issues that we might be raising on April 29th. So I think it would make behoove you to address those with Maureen if you have any questions. I'm ready to, to address those issues at the hearing. Uh, David? Yeah, I'd like to just talk about one item, and I think they'll probably clear it up. And, and it's item number three, discussing uh, the glazing. I think there's some confusion in, in the construction field. Glazing is referred to the method that the glass is held in a frame, not the tinting. But one of the things that we see today is that we see a lot of low E glass, or high E glass, I guess it is. And that tends to, it, it doesn't put a tint on it, but it has a different kind of a reflection when light hits it. Um, but, but I don't think you're intending tinted glass. So, so I don't want to confuse those two issues. If, if Mr. Griffin, I, I, yeah, I'm, I'm painfully familiar with glazing windows, and I thought that's what he was talking about, but I, I was a little concerned because there have been some office buildings that have put the reflective glass, and it yep. just seemed to be so contrary to the whole theme of the town center. I felt the need to raise the issue. Mr. Woods has already called me and assured me that he would never think of doing something like that. I'm sure. Barbara. I would just like to say that I think that the design of the building is most pleasing. I was very happy to see how you put it together and really goes nicely with the town hall. So congratulations. Thank you. Does anybody else have any comments or questions at this point? If not, is there a motion? Board? David. I'll make a motion. Motion for the board to consider be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of ISIS development for a site plan review of Cape Elizabeth Commons, a 15,000 square foot mixed use building to be located at 316 Ocean House Road <coughs> be deemed complete and be it further ordered that the above application be tabled to the regular April 29th planning board meeting at which time a public hearing shall be held. We uh, actually have already moved on the complete issue, sorry. but on the yeah. tabling Everyone. issue, do we have a second? Yeah. Yeah, the motion's been made and seconded. All those in favor? It's unanimous. Uh, thank you. We'll see you thank at you. the uh, April 29th uh, public hearing. Sure thing. Before we adjourn, we have one more order of business to officially welcome Mr. Keneally to the, the board. Thank you. Uh, I'm sure you understand what you're getting into. You are on the zoning board of appeals. That's right. Well, this is nothing like that. So. Thanks, for, thanks for coming. Uh, do I have a motion to adjourn? Mr. Chairman, I make a motion to adjourn. Second. Double, double seconded. All in favor. We're adjourned.